idea, but it's really genius. It's awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and let you watch here. I'm going to mute my mic. Hi, Angel. How are you? Good. Nice job, Mr. 6.10. Um, so one of the toughest challenges that students face when they walk into classrooms is they feel tense. They're worried about being put on the spot, especially if they're behind or don't understand the skill. When they come into our classrooms, they know they're picking up where they left off. We're seeing students' anxiety levels drop and their commitment and desire to master content increase. So I want to shout out Nathaniel and Will. They came on their own time. They got some videos going and they are ahead of pace. Eastern High School is located in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Being 100% free and reduced lunch, our students come to us with varied levels of academic performance. When I came to Eastern, I was sort of shocked with how broad the variety of learning levels was. We have students who have experienced a ton of trauma, who are behind on certain skill sets, are ahead in certain skill sets, have different subsets of experience when they go home. I quickly found out that my traditional model of teaching was not actually effective. So at that time, I realized I needed to make a shift, and I wanted to start by getting rid of the lecture at the beginning of my class. I'm gonna get started today with revision. So Santana and Jamie, just see me in the back real quick. The instructional model that I started implementing, there are three components, blended learning, self-paced structure, and mastery-based grading. What you would see today is really a controlled chaos environment. You have some students starting a new lesson, watching an instructional video, taking their guided notes. You have other kids working on actual lesson assignments, collaborating on whiteboards, really problem solving. And then you'll see other students working on exit tickets to achieve mastery. I like Mr. Bird class because it teaches you independence. For every lesson, we start off with a video, and then during the video, we have to take the notes. Mr. Farrah, he does the videos himself. You'll hear his voice every time you watch a video. In today's lesson, we're going to focus on finding our local maxes and mins. I love it, actually. You get to pause it, stop, and then go back and be able to rewatch the lesson over again until I fully understand and grasp the strategies and formulas. And once they're done watching that instructional video, they transition to some type of an assignment or activity. That's it for, for A, right? Mm-hmm. And then you, we already found the number over there. And now say find the rate of change in the weight of the oil. Everyone learns different. So you may be on lesson five, someone may be on three. It all depends on how you work. It's better than in a regular class where everybody has to stay on the same thing. The students help each other. So if you ahead, you might can help someone that's behind. Okay, so after you get nine over four, you got to divide the whole thing by four. Okay. All right. After that, there's an exit ticket. So an exit ticket is like a mini quiz. It's just a couple questions at the end of the lesson that really succinctly measure the student's ability to execute the activities they learn. So when a student has mastered an exit ticket, they move forward. When they don't, they have a reteach. You're assuming that your Y is zero. Get and then they try a new exit ticket until they've achieved mastery. Showtime. Did you get your exit ticket right? Well, your derivative is spot on. So because I am not delivering a lecture, I'm now free to work with students for the entirety of the class period. X equals four. Yes. Woo. Real quick, just remind me, what do you have to argue? Who is more responsible for perpetuating the Cold War? I'm going to meet with a few people on topic sentences first. The video instruction makes me feel like I've been able to clone myself. Instead of needing to explain a concept and then re-explain the concept and then say it again, I'm giving the instruction on the video, which frees me up to work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Does your topic sentence directly answer the essay question? No, it doesn't. Why, why don't you I like it a lot. I never feel like I'm being rushed or feel like, oh, I already know this. Like, why am I going over this again? I always feel like I'm being challenged. I have a really accurate pulse check of where my students are. So-and-so is on 6.9 and they're about halfway through because I haven't seen an exit ticket yet. Whereas another student has advanced to 6.10 and I can even lean on that student to explain something to their peers. Okay, so you're only gonna use two quote explication charts. <laughs> your two strongest ones. I think it helps with your time management. A Couple days ago, I had to stay at the school to get my work done because I was slacking a little bit. Like when you miss a class, and you can watch the video at home to catch up. Part of the reason this format works so well is we have a lower than average in-seat attendance rate. 
in a traditional format. Once the teacher delivers that lesson, they're moving on to the next lesson the next day, and they don't get an opportunity to go back over it. I've had students who, sadly, in a traditional classroom, they simply would have failed the quarter due to their number of absences for legitimate reasons and often sometimes really heartbreaking reasons. With this way of teaching, that student can come really with more of a fighting chance and ultimately pass a quarter. In our model, if a student is experiencing distress and needs emotional support, it doesn't disrupt the larger classroom environment. I'm able to pivot and work with that student, discuss what's going on, while the other students are able to access the content and flourish. You have to do 10, then put parentheses in the calculator too. I did. Oh, it's supposed to be a positive, girl. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, while this that particular video doesn't speak directly to side by side assessment, I did think it was important because really what they're what the video is talking about is mastery based learning, um, talking about letting kids move at their own pace, letting them um, assist one another and really being accountable or being accountable for what they're doing. Um, every student was at a different place, but they all sort of had the same routine or the same uh, way of moving forward by using the lessons that the teacher uh, uh, provided for them and then the, the exit tickets as their sort of, uh, well, their mastery uh, based assessment to see if they've learned it or not learned it and whether or not they are ready to move on. And so if you notice, the person driving those lessons, really, I mean, the teacher's in the video, but the students are driving the lessons. They are moving to the lessons as they're ready for them and uh, either moving forward as quickly as they, they can or slowing down if they need to. And so I really felt like that particular video really is genius and, and um, it, it makes it seem um, like the class just seems like it runs so smoothly. Um, now, the teacher is doing some work at the front end. The teacher is having to create those videos or at least find videos that um, uh, will do the teaching for them, either through Khan Academy or um, something similar to that. But if you notice, one of the students said in there that, you know, you hear your teacher's voice every time you hear the video. And, um, and the really cool thing is it makes that teacher available for students to uh, to ask for you know one to one help or to uh, have that teacher actually uh, assist them when they need it. Now it's similar to a flipped classroom, but not really, because they're not the teacher's not asking the students to go home and watch the videos and come back prepared to work the next day. Um, the videos are available to them right there in class. They watch them right there. They do the work. They talk to their their uh, the other students in class. I mean, it's all sort of self contained. And um, so I thought that might be something that you all might uh, find valuable and that you might want to share with your teachers, because I do feel like that might be a way for them to um, um, look at blended learning in a little bit different way. Um, you can't really call that station rotation unless you want to call each, each um, student expectation a different station. I suppose you could look at it that way. But reality is kids are moving at their own pace. And so I thought that was pretty awesome. So be, um, you know, you're welcome to certainly share that with your student or with your teachers and um, give them maybe some new ideas for their toolbox. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to uh, slide three. Some of you I bet have already looked ahead. Um, and what we're gonna do, and I know you guys have done Jigsaw before, this is nothing new. This is something that we have done, you know, I know we did it, we used to do it quite a bit several years ago, um, but I was doing some reading on uh, and, and watching some, some webinars by John Hattie, and really Jigsaw is one of uh, the best activities or a very good activity, and it has a really f high effective rate. And so I decided we would do this today. Don't tell anybody that I, I made cop a copy, just one copy, of chapter nine of the book <laughs> of, of our friend here. 
Um, but since we're studying it, I feel like uh, it's okay. You're not going to take it and copy it and sell it and give it to other people. So um, what we're going to do, each group is going to read an assigned portion of the text. You're going to create a short presentation summarizing the most important parts of what you read. Um, and then each group is going to come back and present their section to the rest of the group. Okay. And what I've done here is I have given each breakout room, and you'll notice when I put you in breakout rooms, in the upper um, left corner, it'll tell you exactly what breakout room you're in, the number you're in. And I am going to create eight breakout rooms. And depending on what your breakout room number is, that's the slide that you'll actually be working on. Now, the image that is here, the empowered learning, you're welcome to remove that if you want to. It's just on every single slide. But if you need that whole real estate, you can uh, get rid of that completely if you'd like. You can certainly get rid of the breakout room number if you would like. This is just to help you sort of um, understand or know which slide you're supposed to be working on. Uh, if you look at slide four, it also tells you exactly what page numbers you are going to be reading, okay? So in some cases, it's two pages. In some cases, it's one. And depending on your breakout room, breakout room one is going to read 117 through 118. And of course, they will be on slide five and so forth, okay? Any questions about this? Make sure that you do click on the link so that you will have... you will have a copy of chapter nine. So you'll notice the page number is here. That's why the page numbers are so high. Um, but you'll notice the page number is at the bottom and um, you just read those pages that are assigned to your group. Okay, any questions? You guys are all set. You've done this before, I'm sure of it. So it's not new. So let me go ahead and place you in breakout rooms. And I am going to do eight breakout rooms. How did it know I was going to do eight? It tells me eight. That's a little bit scary, okay? So you guys are going to be mixed up. Um, you're not going to be with your leadership, but that's okay. I want you to get ideas from other campuses as well. And so you are going to be mixed. Let me make sure I don't have one breakout room of one person. No, but I do have one breakout room of two people. So I may move somebody uh, down to, Norma, I'll probably move you down to that breakout room just so that there's three in that one instead of just two. All right, here you go. I'll see you guys in a bit. Darn it, I was saying such amazing things. <laughs> I was just saying uh, it's awesome that you guys did this so quickly that now I have a whole slideshow that I can use to present elsewhere and I can just say I did it, right? Um, but uh, I appreciate it. I hope you guys found something interesting and I hope as we go through um, each slide that you'll be able to get a really good understanding of this whole chapter. So let's go ahead and start with um, group or breakout room one. And if one of you would be willing to please present this slide, I would appreciate it. Do you wanna present it Ms. Tonder or Ms. Bias? Yes, I'll read it. I'll read it. Do you want to show her? You want me to present it, and then you 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 want to present? Okay. We can all see it though. So um, ours is the very beginning of the chapter, of course. And things that we learned in there is teachers need to embrace new teaching strategies. In other words, you know, change our thinking and how we go about things, and not wanting to grade everything. Teachers need to take a closer look at what they are grading and why. And grading everything can be counterproductive and it included this little flow chart in the second page which i thought was really neat it says what is the purpose of this work okay if we're just practicing or reviewing something you don't need to give feedback or a grade if you're working toward a product like if you're writing or you're working on something feedback with the child but no no grading yet just a conversation or feedback and then if it's an assessment or it's a finished product then that's when you grade so we I like this and we talked about also um, what to do with the elementary babies because you know a lot of the examples are middle school and high school and yeah that's a lot easier when they can you know tie their own shoe and go get their stuff and so we had a little conversation about that. 
And and what what did you what would you uh, come up with? Well, the discussion was um, well, third through six, of course, is easier, you know, because mm -hmm. they're older. And then we talked about with the littles, like um, doing the tiered the tiered literacy stations, the ice station lessons, you know, based on milestones or running records. More, you know, it's not it's they're not going to be as independent as um, the upper grades, of course. That's true. true. That's true. true. I also, the things like, go ahead. I'm sorry. I also like the fact that if we can get more teachers to do this, like like the video that we saw, that's all. You know, we know that the power is in small groups. That's all I do as an interventionist all day, every day. So I I know the power in that. So if we can get the littles to do their own thing and train them, that's more time that the teachers can spend all day with these babies. You know, one on one, two or one, and that's going to really help them grow. That's my soapbox. Absolutely, and I love that. I love that you call them the littles. I love that. <laughs> I've heard it before, but I really love the littles. That's awesome. Does anybody have any questions? No? All right. And I love that piece is uh, asking, you know, uh, what are teachers grading and why? The whole, the whole purpose. Are you grading it because you think you have to? Or are you grading it because you think the student has learned it? And, and the, ho the whole idea that you don't grade practice. I mean, if I'm just learning something and I have no idea what this concept is, let me explore it a little bit. Don't grade me because I don't know. But once I've practiced and I've, I've um, you know, looked at it and worked on it for a little bit and, and gotten a little bit of feedback from the teacher, then it makes sense to, to actually grade the assessment or the product, whatever the end is. Because if I'm just learning it, how can you grade me on something that I know nothing about, right? So that's awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much. Good job. And I love that chart, too. <laughs> so let's go ahead and go to, let me get my mouse over there somewhere. There we go. Let's go ahead and go to slide six. And who would like to, uh, this is breakout room two, and who would like to go ahead and present that slide? Hi, this is Mr. Plunk. I was part of the group, and I was the one writing out the notes, so I don't mind. I'll go ahead and, and present. Right. So right. ours, ours followed on from, of course, the preceding slide in terms of the flow of the text. So the, the flow diagram that they presented uh, leads directly into what was described on our particular page about the choice menu that teachers have, basically, about feedback. But the key point on our section was that students are going to need feedback if you make the determination that it's going to be a graded, finished product. And the type of feedback that students get along the way is driven by that decision up front. So once a teacher decides, yes, there's a finished product involved, and yes, that finished product is going to be graded, then that defines the role the teacher has as a coach in the process and the type of feedback the students need along the way, <coughs> excuse me, in order to be successful with that finished product. So the, the key here is that as students are working, the type of process you're having them do, the duration, those are all key factors on when and how feedback is given for students to be able to be successful. And there's a table which was too big for us to include in the slide. Uh, so we summarized the table with our final bullet point with the little three subs underneath it, is that it's basically a, a, a textual description of that flow chart. So if you're looking at the first step, then there's the inclusion of options for self-assessment or peer assessment as opposed to teacher assessment. But there is the option there for students to assess themselves, uh, provide their own feedback or evaluation of their work or have peer review in small group or partner situations. Um, there's also the importance of the timing of feedback that if there's that opportunity to small group conference with the teacher or do the side-by-side -side process to know where are they at in the mid steps, especially if it's a product that's taking multiple days or is more of a project scope, you don't want the feedback to be at the very end when it's too late for the student to be able to do much. And uh, stress the importance, of course, about rubrics, that a rubric should be clear, concise, and focused on the specific skills that the students need to demonstrate for mastery. Very, very good. Yeah, uh, that's one thing uh, that I got out of this chapter as I was reading it is, is we do use rubrics often, but we have to be careful not to grade every single thing on the rubric, especially if it's a writing assignment. Um, that can be overwhelming and, and kids really need to have the opportunity to focus on one or two things that they're really trying to get better on. 
and um, and and if you narrow that focus down for them, it's easier for you as a teacher to look for those particular things, and it's a lot easier for a student to practice those particular things. And um, I I really appreciated that because I do think sometimes, uh, and I love to use rubrics. Don't get me wrong, but I do think sometimes you need to just work on one piece of a rubric at a time. And so that's awesome. Thank you. Are there any questions about um, this particular piece? Nope. All right. All righty then. Let's go ahead and move on. As soon as I find, there it is. My mouse gets lost in the, I don't know where. So here we go. All right. So let's go ahead and go to breakout room three. And uh, who would like to present this slide? Our page was about the notion of less is more. There's a lot of times when teachers focus more on the actual practice of grading a paper and you know marking up uh, notes and don't actually give the feedback to the kids in real time so that there's a, a formal assessment and essentially it becomes assumptive by turning in the paper. So the whole gist of it is to have a very specific purpose for when you provide feedback, sit with the kids and give them feedback along the process so that you know that the assignment is going well. And essentially by grading less, you're able to devote more time to spending with the kids on a one-on-one -on -one basis or with small groups. So don't beat yourself up over the grading, but instead focus and hone that time in for the practice of feedback and growth with kids. That's awesome. It seems so simple, right? But, you know, for whatever reason, uh, we've got it in our minds as teachers anyway, that we have to grade everything a student turns in or everything a student works on. Um, but it only makes sense that that really you should grade um, the things students have learned and you have to actually give them the opportunity to learn it. And it does open up time for teachers. It does give them the time to work one-on-one -on -one with students um, uh, to help them with understanding and, and just that whole idea of small group. And again, what, what Ms. Callender was saying is that's where the power is, is that small group. And so that's awesome, awesome. Any questions? Nope, all right, all right. Let's go on to group, uh, or breakout room four. And who would like to present this one? Okay, Shelly, I will be presenting for group four. Uh, so our section was uh, select a blended learning model design uh, as for you to design your lesson. So the, a lot of the times the teachers are concerned about what's going to be happening while they're meeting side by side with the students. So first they have to decide uh, what's going to be happening with the other kids. Are they going to select a, a which type of blended learning uh, model? You, you could choose the station rotation or you could choose the playlist model. In this particular example, they chose the station rotation. So we have a diagram there with all the, the stations that were chosen so that, that you can see. Uh, then that all those stations are led by the students. They're self-directed. So one very key and important uh, thing that teachers need to do is make sure that they have very clear and focused instructions for each of the stations so that you don't have the students coming back having questions about what to do. Uh, you also have to make sure that you're balancing the online, offline, the individual and the collaborative tasks that you have in those stations. And then when you're meeting with the students, you're going to provide a um, uh, high student accountability for all those students. But then uh, one thing that I think we forgot to put it there, I don't see, oh no, I see it. Uh, when you're meeting with the students on the self, uh, the side-by-side -side assessment, you are providing them feedback on three to four main points, not, not everything. Like what you were talking about with a rubric, you don't grade everything. It's only talking about three or four main points. And I think that's all we had there. That's awesome. And and this is specifically, and I uh, the station rotation, I do know um, a lot of teachers do use playlists. Um, uh, and again, as long as the activities are purposeful and engaging and um, you'll keep kids interested in what they're doing. And, and you know, part of that, that classroom culture is to teach them to be more independent and to teach them to be more self-directed and not to rely on the teacher for every single question they might have. There are other kids in class, there are 
you know, instructions posted, whatever it is that they need. And that, again, opens up time for the teacher to work with students, either small groups or individual or whatever it is that, that they need to do at that time. Even if they go with that sort of, and I don't know what it's called, from the modern classroom, I would say it's almost like a flipped classroom, but more like an in-class flipped classroom. I don't know. Um, but they could even go with a model similar to that as well. And that would still give them the time to do those side-by-side -side assessments while everyone else is, is working on, you know, whatever piece they need to be working on. Any questions? You guys are gifted. This is the GT group, I can tell. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and go to nine. And breakout room five, who would like to present this one? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> I'll go ahead and present. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, we were in our section, it was talking about rubrics. And so um, the main points are students are provided a rubric at the beginning of an assignment so that there's transparency in how they're going to be graded and they're aware of what it's going to take for them to be successful. Um, always, you know, ask students to complete the self-assessment um, using a rubric so they can see where they're at. Um, have the students, um, having the rubric allows them to evaluate their work and reflect on their skills. Um, also, students assess themselves and have to think critically about the quality of their work and articulate the reasoning behind their score. So they can't just give themselves a score, they have to really think about why they got that score. And then students can identify areas of weakness prior to the side-by-side -side assessment. And so they can have some reflection on that. That, that, that's correct. And you know, one of the things that Catlin Tucker suggests or, or, or encourages is to have students um, score themselves first, to give themselves a score. And then when they come and do the side-by-side -side assessment, they explain, this is why I gave myself this score because of X, Y, Z. And you really um, uh, hold them accountable for what it is they they are learning and for what the rubric says so that they know it's, it's tied to the rubric. And um, I think that's actually a really great way for them to um, just ensure that they've got everything that they need in the in the assignment and to validate that what they're doing is is accurate or correct. Any questions? No? All right. Ugh, come on. Okay. So breakout room six, who would like to present this one? I can go ahead and do it. All right, perfect. So our section was about issue logistics and preparation of conducting side-by-side -side assessments. So it talked a little bit about making sure you have your space set up where you can comfortably seat two people. Um, teacher and student should ideally be side to side, and the teacher should also be positioned in the classroom where they can oversee everyone else who's working. Um, they talked about having paper copies of the rubric ready. That way, when you're making your notes, or circling different parts of language that you're looking for. Um, it'll be right there so the kids can see how you're going back and forth referring to the rubric. Um, and it helps to make it quick and manageable. They recommend spending three to four minutes with each student. They talked a little bit about how at the beginning, establishing a new routine will take a little bit longer. Um, but ideally, you want to stick to three to four minutes per kiddo. Um, they talked a little bit about the quick transitions with mineral disruption. So maybe having your tables numbered, having kids within close proximity, and the use of a timer to stay on track. They did say when you do set a timer to make sure that it's not going to cut you off or cut your thinking off with the kids. Um, it's just going off to make sure that you know that you need to pick up your pace slightly and go ahead and finish your conference with the student. And then make sure that you are, like with any new practice, establishing the process to the students and kind of going over the new routine and explaining the idea of modeling a think aloud. Very good, awesome. Uh, again, saving time, saving time. Um, be very purposeful about how much time you want kids to spend so that they get right to it and you're not wasting uh, any of that valuable class time. So very good, any questions? Let's see, yeah, awesome. Yes, good job. 
Good job, Ashley. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and go to breakout room seven. And who would like to present? Good morning. I'll be presenting, Shelley. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So uh, when we start off reading this portion of the chapter, uh, Tucker does mention that one of the most important um, part of the side-by-side -side assessment uh, strategy is the think aloud. And um, Ashley just mentioned that. So the think aloud actually brings about the metacognition of the student and is able to explain their learning. So it makes great the grading process very transparent through the think aloud. Um, the student actually, you know, is able to verbalize and that helps the teacher also know, you know, what are the misunderstandings or the misconceptions uh, in their learning. Um, the rubric, which a lot of people have mentioned the rubric, it allows a teacher to stay focused. If you're only going to, if you're only going to be looking, for example, at, um, you know, the topic sentence or the theme or something, the rubric allows you to stay focused. Um, it's not a time when you're doing the side-by-side -side assessment, it is not necessarily a time to reteach but briefly to provide feedback on the work. And um, it suggests, you know, taking notes on the skill that you are noticing at the time as a teacher, what needs to be retaught or what still seems unclear to the students. Very much like it reminds me of uh, Anna, taking anecdotal notes as you're doing guided reading. Again, noting what needs to be, um, you know, refined and refocus so the student can understand further and providing a safe environment for the student because uh, at the end you're obviously obviously going to ask you know are there any more questions do you have any questions and usually the student doesn't because you're pretty involved during that conversation but it does provide that safe environment and um it was beautifully said uh, nurturing a partnership of learning um you know in it um we saw sort of a mirroring of of the conferencing that we do with one-to-one -one students because it allows for a lot of conversation to to occur between teacher and student. And that's Very good. I love it. And and uh, I do love the fact that, you know, the teacher is working with the student throughout the process, providing feedback during practice, providing feedback, you know, all along the way. So by the time they get to that actual ass assessment, they've had lots of feedback ready that they could they could use to improve or to understand um, whatever the assessment is or whatever product they're creating. And so and I love the fact that that the teacher has the ability to to work individually with every single student at some point because that really is important to students. They like spending that time with teacher and um, it's so much more valuable for them to understand, um, you know, what the process actually is instead of saying, okay, get it done, get it done. Give me the draft. I, especially with, with essays, you might, it might take, you know, once you get all those essays in and you're in a secondary um, school, you may have a hundred essays that you have to grade. That's probably not going to be done by tomorrow. And so that feedback is delayed. And by the time they do get it back, you're already on to something else. And so this really provides that time for those kids. Awesome. Any questions? All right. So we are on slide 12. This is our last and final slide. Who would like to present? I can present. Okay, so um, basically, um, it's just a recap, I guess, of what everybody else has already said. Um, so we said um, it was, it's basically less time grading. So one of the things that it starts off with is how a teacher was saying how, you know, she was taking so much home and she was grading so much and it was taking a lot of her time. So um, it talked about how with this, you're actually, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's about less time grading, but it's about more time on doing these other things. So you are building that personal relationship with the student. It is that one-on-one, -on -one. it is personalized. So the student tends to feel valued if the student tends to feel like they're, you know, that the teacher cares about them. Um, it also builds that transparency. So I know we were talking about, you know, with feedback, we were talking about with, you know, it ties in with, you know, data, things like that. Like, you know, it just makes it, um, it just shows the student where they are and where they need to, you know, where they need to grow and things like that. Um, again, like we said, personalized feedback, it's immediate. So, you know, it's not like a week or two later and, you know, they're getting that graded paper and like, well, what does this mean? You know, so they get it right then and there. And then, you know, we did talk about the rubrics and how it just, you know, it gives them more time to create and a, a, an understanding of those clear expectations. And so that's why we put uh, the diamond there. 
because it is about transparency. It is about making those clear expectations. And it's about, you know, just, you know, making your um, instruction, you know, more refined and polished and beautiful. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, it is about building relationships and building individual relationships with each student. And can you imagine teachers would really know exactly where those kiddos are because they're following up with them along the way and they would have a really good understanding of, of what individual students need and, and where they're at in the process. And so I, I think this is a really, um, uh, you know, not, I think it could be kind of simple, simple in the fact that teachers aren't having to do so much grading um, and in the fact that students are getting that that one on one time. So I think that's awesome. What do you guys think? What do you think about side by side assessment? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs this way, this way. <laughs> OK, yeah, I think it's awesome. And I do you think it's doable in your classrooms for your teachers to do? Is this something they could actually do? Uh, Miss Marwood, I, I think it is. I I was implemented blended learning when I was in the classroom, and I can tell you the article that we read is exactly the process that I was doing with my writing. And I didn't feel overwhelmed when I was grading the writing because I would only teach one piece of the rubric, mm -hmm. and then I would sit and do my conferencing. The, the kids were doing their peer conferencing, so, I mean, by the time they came, they did their peer conferencing and they came to me, most of it was troubleshooted. And then I would keep notes of the things that they were having difficulty with. Mm -hmm. And when I met with them again, we would talk about, did we improve? Are we improving? What other, I mean, it was, it was just a wonderful process. Mm -hmm. To me, it was not stressful at all. It was just, um, awesome. yeah. Teaching, teaching writing can be overwhelming for a teacher. Um, it, it really can because it's such an involved process and there are so many pieces. Um, and if you're a secondary teacher and, and you're doing writing, that can be extremely time consuming. And so I, I love that process. That's awesome. And I'm sure your, your students really grew from that and were able to, to grow and move forward. And, and I'm sure they learned a lot. How about the rest of you? Do you think this is something teachers can do in their classroom? Your teachers? Yeah, I think so. Shall I? Um, go ahead. Um, last year, we implemented the side by side writing um, assessment with our fourth grade team. And I was hesitant to bring it back because that was after the conference with Kathleen Tucker. <laughs> and um, so but it it worked out beautifully and it really turned into a sustainable practice. And that wow. was that chapter that we read. It was really something that it gave immediate feedback right. and the kids were involved in that you know assessment process so um that one worked really well awesome that's awesome um i love it i love hearing the stories and i love knowing that it that it's working well or has worked well for you so thank you guys so much i appreciate you being here um the slideshow is yours make sure you don't make too many changes on it though because we all have access to make changes um, but I'll probably make a copy, so I'll have one of my own. So if you want to keep it just like it is, you probably want to make a copy. Um, and that way you'll have the link to the, the article and you can share it with teachers and also the link to the video that you can share with your teachers. So thank you guys so much for being here today and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>